want to welcome everybody this morning. We've got a good crowd today, and that's wonderful. A few announcements that we need to make as we get started. First of all, we have a thank you card from the Wilma Medlin family. It says, many thanks to all of you. Mom loved all of you so much. The meal was wonderful, and many thanks to the ladies for that. The flowers were all so, so beautiful. Love to all, Frana. So we'll post this out on the bulletin board out front. The communion supplies are on the back table, if anybody's here and didn't know that. Also the offering basket, so make sure if you need that you get one of those. Also, if you're visiting, and I see we have several visitors, please fill out a card in front of you so we'll have a record of your visit. Just put it in the offering basket or leave it in the pew and we'll pick it up. Richard and Cheryl Lively have been having some problems. Um, Richard, as I understand it, is in a swing bed right now and will remain there for at least 14 days. And he has had and continues to have a a plethora of problems, so let's remember them. They've also been trying to move during all this. There's a new address, and that will be listed for all of you all. And then just this morning, I heard that from their old house, they had a whole bunch of stuff, good stuff, stolen. So uh, she's been having a little problem. Let's remember Richard and Cheryl in prayer, please. I don't have a brand new report on Ron Putman. I, he's still in town, right, and has not had anything done yet, but we need to continue to remember Ron and Cheryl in, in prayer. Uh, Tiffany McKee Robinson, uh, Ronnie and Marita's daughter, is to have a report on the 18th of May to tell about her surgery, when, and exactly what, so we need to remember that. We reported, I think it was Wednesday night, about Gary and Jeannie's friend from the Clinton congregation, Jim Baird. He did pass away yesterday, and uh, Gary just told me that they have another friend, Farron McCatherin, who has, was it prostate? Prostate cancer. So we need to remember that in prayer. Ricky Trent is with us in his normal spot, and his daughter, Raquel, is going to be undergoing surgery. We need to remember her in prayer. The Cordell Christian home, I think, is in need of prayers. They're due to COVID and other things. They're encountering some problems. So let's remember the Cordell Christian home. It's a major, major thing in this town, and uh, we need for it to prosper, do well. Also, we've had a report from some of our Christian brothers in India about the horrendous struggles that are going on right now. I mean, life over there is a little trying at best anyway, and now with the COVID problem that they're really experiencing hard times. So let's remember them in prayer as well. Tonight and tomorrow night, Cameron Cochran, where are you, Cameron? I saw you somewhere, is graduating from high school, and I'm not sure if we need to pray more for Cameron or for Mama about that. <laughs> Um, Wednesday night, we are going to have fried hamburgers, and Dr. Greg Turner is going to act as the fry man, and he's, I'm calling him Chef Boy RD, so <laughs> we'll, we'll work on the details of all the rest of that, but Doc's frying us some burgers up Wednesday night. I don't have any other announcements at this time. Does anybody have something that needs to be said? Burke will. Direct us in prayer, please. Father, we come to you this morning as believers in your Son. We put our faith in him for our salvation, and we know that what you've said in your word is true, and we live our lives as best we can to that standard. We're grateful that we have many visitors here this morning. We know they're in town for, this, um, for the Mother's Day holiday. Lord, help us to love each other, not just in our immediate families, but as a Christian family, as we see in the book of Acts and going forward through Scripture. Lord, we have Christians all over the world who are in need of our prayers, our support in any way we can, people in places where they are persecuted daily. They don't have resources that we do in this country. They don't have the freedoms that we do in this country. They are constantly under threat, either from COVID or 
from persecution of local other religions who hate Christianity simply because we follow the name of Christ and we preach it. Lord, we thank you for the time we have here each week. Help us to worship you today, sing as loudly as we can in praise of you, and knowing that you are on the throne and that you look down upon us, not with judgment, but with love for those of you who, those of us who have put our faith in the name of your son. Help us to love each other today, worship together, enjoy each other's company, and do so going forward. Thank you for this congregation is growing, not just in number, but in spirituality and the belief we have and the love we have for each other. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Glory Land Way. I'm in the way of
Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the day. We want to thank you for the opportunity we have to come together, we pray, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do want to continue to pray for those that were mentioned this morning, that their health isn't what they want it to be. We pray that if it be your will, you restore them to their much-wanted health. Dear Lord, we want to pray for those families that have lost loved ones. We pray that you comfort them as only you can. Dear Lord, we want to pray for this country and the countries throughout the world that peace doesn't seem to be abounding through this world. We pray that you intervene and that peace will abound through this world, especially our brothers and sisters in India. Dear Lord, we want to pray for all the mothers throughout this world. We pray that you bless them, the mothers that can't be with their children, the military mothers, the all mothers that just need your, need your guidance and prayer today. We pray for them. Dear Lord, we want to continue to pray for this congregation that the things we're doing is in accordance with your will and that we are spreading your word and we have the right kind of heart to do those things. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us so that we might have a hope of everlasting life. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for being in control of this world because sometimes it seems dark and we just pray that we put our faith and trust in you. Be with us now as we go through this service. We pray that everything we say and do be in accordance with your holy and divine will. Continue to bless us and forgive us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. that it's uh, Mother's Day, and I want to make sure that we congratulate each of you ladies, mothers and grandmothers, and we want you to know how much we appreciate you, and we want you to know that you are deserving of honor, and so I see a lot of visitors across the audience today, and I know you're here because you are, and your family unit's going to celebrate Mother's Day, and so we want to congratulate each of you mothers. I uh, am not going to talk about mothers, though, in this sermon. I know a lot of times on uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Fourth of July, all those kind of things, we kind of tie our lessons to those things. But we are beginning this morning a new series in the book that we call the Book of Acts. And uh, I'm not sure how long it'll last. It'll not last as long as some of the series we've been been doing, not last a year, I don't think. It'll last hopefully only a few months as we take some lessons from the book of Acts. This morning we're going to introduce this uh, study, and you probably are seeing something on the screen, or you should be. Anybody know what that is? Well, it's supposed to be an eraser. Uh, When you were in grade school, do you remember anything like that? I don't know how that we got the, the list, but when I was in grade school, you would, before school would start, you would get a list of school supplies. And you'd go somewhere here in town and you'd get the school supplies, and it would be scissors and, and glue 
And it would be spiral notebooks and pencils and always at least one or more erasers. And I like the erasers because I could make all those mistakes with my pencil and I could rub out those uh, mistakes and uh, start all over. I kind of wish this morning as we start in the book of Acts that we could kind of erase all the things that we know about the book of Acts and that we could look at it freshly and openly as though we had never read it before. Now, I'm not saying that what we have been taught in the past or what we've seen in the past is in any way wrong. It's probably perfectly right. But sometimes I long just to look at the scriptures freshly and openly as though I've never seen them before and try to decide what is God really trying to say to us through these words. So though it's impossible, I wish I could erase what you've known in the past and we could all start freshly. Now, second thing I want to tell you about the book of Acts. I personally don't like the name of the book. Does that shock some of you and bother some of you? You realize how all this was put together, don't you? Th- through the years, there were, there were scholars who would come together and they'd take these various scrolls and pieces of parchment and some of them were little fragments here and another fragment there and they would spend years putting them together and they would be looking at the original. This is going off and on on me, I think. So back up a little bit more. But anyway, they would look at the original language and, and put it down so that we could understand what it's saying and they are the ones who put these... Uh, books in chapter form and verse form. And they are the ones who selected the names of the books. And so often, as you read through the Bible, the names of the books are written as titles with the person who did write it. Like in the Old Testament, you have Isaiah, and you have Ezekiel, and you have Jeremiah, and you have Daniel, and in the New Testament, Matthew, and Mark, and Luke, and John. And, and then sometimes they were titled based upon to whom they were written. So you have Galatians, and you have Ephesians, and you have Romans, and, and, and that kind of thing. But somehow, someone decided to look at this book, and they said it's all about the acts of the apostles, the things the apostles did. I, I, I don't think that's the right view of this book. If I were choosing a title for this book, I would choose what's on your screen. The story continues. The story continues. Because this is the continuation of the story of Jesus Christ. The story is going to continue in the book of Acts. And you realize the entire Bible is about the story of Jesus. The Old Testament predicts the coming of Jesus. In the Gospels, Jesus is presented to us with all of his wonderful teaching and all of his ability to do miracles and, and all those things. And in the book of Acts, the story is going to continue in that Jesus is going to be preached over and over and over again. So if I could change the title, I would change the title to something like the story of Jesus continues. And that's what I want you to try to capture as we begin and as we make our way through this material. Now, I want to read the first 11 verses of the book of Acts. And... As we begin in verse 1, I'm going to read it from my phone because from my phone I have the easy-to-read version. I want to read out of that. The first thing you'll notice is it's written to a... And Theophilus is a person. I know from our past what we've been taught. Remember what we've been taught? That the word Theophilus means what? Lover of God. And this is the second book this author has written. The author of this book is the one named Luke. He's not an apostle. Luke is the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote it to a person named Theophilus. But it's never made sense to me to think that this was written to all those people who love God because these books are for people who may not even know God, that they might come to know Him through Jesus Christ. Theophilus seems to be a person. And so Luke writes, Dear Theophilus, the first book I wrote was about everything Jesus did 
and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up into heaven. In other words, the first book was Jesus being presented. Remember that? What he taught, the miracles that he did. Before he went back into the heaven, he talked to the apostles he had chosen. With the help of the Holy Spirit, he told them what they should do. This was after his death. But he showed them he was alive, proving it to them in many ways. The apostles saw Jesus many times during the 40 days after he was raised from the dead. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. One time when Jesus was eating with them, he told them not to leave Jerusalem. He said, wait until we receive the promise the Father made. Remember what I told you before? John baptized people with water. But in the days to come, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The apostles were all together. They asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time for you to give the people of Israel their kingdom again? Jesus said to them, the Father is the only one who has the authority to decide dates and times. They are not for you to know. Now, I hope you catch that. There are some things you and I aren't supposed to know. And we would love to know everything, wouldn't we? We want to know every single detail, and we try to figure out every single detail. And the truth of the matter is we've been called to live by faith and not by sight. And not even by complete knowledge, because we'll never come upon you and give you power. And you'll be my witnesses, and you will tell people everywhere about me. In Jerusalem, the rest of Judea, in Samaria, in every part of the world. And after Jesus had said this, he was lifted up into the sky. And while they were watching, he went into a cloud. They could not see him. They were staring into the sky where he had gone, and suddenly two men wearing white were standing beside them. And they said, men of Galilee, why are you standing looking into the sky? You saw Jesus carried away from you into heaven. He'll come back in the same way you saw him go. And so there's not much new to that story, is there? Luke reminds us that Jesus died. But that's not an uncommon thing. People die all the time. Charles told me this morning as he came in, he said, I just saw a snippet of it, and I guess in the day of Oklahoma or something, about someone from the Cowden area, born in 1931, died. He couldn't remember the name. I don't know who that is. But it'll probably be in our local paper this week. One, two, three, four people have died. It's not an uncommon thing to die. And Jesus was buried, put in a, a tomb made out of rock, and the, and the stone was rolled across it, and it's not an uncommon thing at all for someone who dies to be buried. It happens all the time. But what makes this story so unusual is that three days later, some people came to visit that tomb, and the stone was gone, rolled away at least. And when they finally went into the tomb, the body was gone. And the logical conclusion is, the body has been stolen. Someone took it. What else could happen? By the way, what else possibly could happen? But then we learn that by the power of the Spirit of God, Jesus was raised to live again. Raised to live again. And you say, that can't be right. That is impossible. We don't see that happening. We haven't seen it since. We, we don't. But it says, according to Luke, that 40 days he showed himself very much alive, and especially to the apostles, over and over again, so that they would know. So that someone like Thomas, who would be like Ken, and say, I'm just not sure. And he would say, just put your, put your finger right here. I am alive. And now Luke gives more detail to one part of the story we don't talk about much. The apostles are talking with Jesus, and, and suddenly he begins to be lifted up. Now, 
I, I've never seen it, but I understand in Las Vegas that there's a magic show, or used to be, where someone would be lifted up. What do they call it? Levitate? But they would be lifted up a few feet and come back down, but he just didn't come back down. He just kept going up. And the apostles are watching until he disappears into the clouds, and, and they are so amazed, and, and you think, well, they've seen a lot. They, they've seen so much uh, skin covered with leprosy. And Jesus makes it like a baby's skin. Or they've seen angry waters on the sea, so violent, and with just a word, they calm. But they've never seen anything like this. And they're watching, and some angels appear, and the angels say, you know what? He's going to come back. In the very same way he left, he's going to come back. Now, when? It says it's not for us to know that time. And frankly, it's not happened for a long time, and frankly, I never think about it. Do you know that? I never think about it. Day by day by day, I just go about my routine. And I, I, but you know what's going on? One of these days when I'm not thinking about it, there's going to be a loud trumpet call. I'm going to look around. I'm going to look up into the sky. And I'm going to see Jesus coming with a mighty band of angels and with all the redeemed of all the ages. And that's the story that we have to continue. And what Jesus says is to the apostles, I want you to be my witnesses. I want you to keep telling this story here in Jerusalem. And I want you to tell it in the rest of Judea. I want you to tell it in Samaria. In fact, I just want you to go to the entire world. And I want you to tell my story. I want you to be my witnesses. So I started this week. This is the part of the lesson I really want you to think about thinking about what it means to be a witness. I decided there are three types of witnesses that I know about. You may know more than I, but there are eyewitnesses. If we have a traffic accident out here, Donnie, you've worked a lot of these, and you're trying to figure out, maybe there's more than two cars involved, and you're trying to figure out what, what happened, what, what really took place if there is an eyewitness, or there are a couple of eyewitnesses, you can take down what they say and you can begin to piece it together and really understand exactly what happened. And if I am a prosecuting attorney in a court of law, and, and, and we're trying someone, and I'm trying to convince the jury of guilt, and I can turn to an eyewitness, or maybe two, and they give their testimony, then I've got a strong case. It's a powerful thing to have eyewitness testimony. And the 11 men to whom we're talking right now, Jesus is talking, only 11, the 12th hasn't been chosen yet to replace Judas. The 11 men were absolutely eyewitnesses to all of this. But therein lies a major problem. Because these 11 men chosen by Jesus are just ordinary men. And what happens to ordinary people? We die. We die. And so when the last apostle died, the last eyewitness is gone. So there's a second kind of witness. There's what I call the expert witness. In a court of law, especially in liability cases, product liability cases, you always bring in expert witnesses. The prosecution, the defense, both will bring in expert witnesses. And they are people who have great knowledge about the subject matter. They are great people who have great knowledge about the technical details. And so in our world, it's a farming world. If someone is injured out on a farm and they begin to conclude, I don't think this was my fault. I think it was a, a poor design in the tractor. I think it was a poor design in the implement. I think it was a poor design in the hay baler. And so they sue the company. 
Happens all the time. Both sides will bring expert witnesses. And they give this testimony based on all their knowledge and all their facts. And do you know that we can continue the story today with knowledge and with facts that we have learned through the years and we can keep telling the story of Jesus? But I caution you with that. I caution you with that. For the last many weeks, I've talked about the pitfalls of religion and how religion is knowledge-based and how religion is about what you do and how you do it, but it tends to leave out the heart. And sometimes if we try to continue the story of Jesus with facts and figures and knowledge only, it becomes so hollow. So last Sunday, I drove home. I pulled into my driveway. I saw an older couple. That just means they're older than I, okay? And they're over mowing the lot to the south of our lot. It's a beautiful, large lot. He was on the lawnmower. She was standing out under a shade tree. I waved. Then I just walked over. And I started talking to them, to her, about the beautiful lot and, and so forth. And, and she said, by looking at me, you've been to church, haven't you? I said, yes, ma'am, I have. She said, where do you go? I said, I attend in that little church building up there on the highway. And she said, well, which one? I said, well, just across from the grocery store to the north. It's called Northside Church of Christ. Now, I don't remember her exact word-for-word language, but I remember this part. Are they stuffy? Rigid? That's kind of her view of people who have to dress a certain way and act a certain way and stuffy and all the knowledge. And I said, no, ma'am, they're not. I said, we try to do things as simplistically as we possibly can. No fluff, just as simple as we possibly can. And I said, they're really a kind people. And she looked at me and she said, are they really kind or they just pretend to be kind? She said, I love God, but I gave up on church a long time ago because of the way people act. And I thought, wow, sometimes that happens when you become so rigid with knowledge and you try to tell the story of Jesus based on knowledge and fact and, and sometimes it comes across like that. So there's a third kind of witness I don't know, Charles, what the title of this witness ought to be, but there's a witness who will come forward and give testimony based on what's happened to them because. So if there's been some kind of a, a, a problem, some kind of an injury, and I come forth and they put me on the witness stand, I am a witness to say, yes, this is what happened. This, this is, or these are the facts, but it left me and I can't use this arm any longer. It, it, it's impacted my life adversely like this and this and this, or it's impacted my life for the good like this and this and this. A few years ago, not too many years ago, a friend of mine who now lives in the Phoenix area called me and he said, Ken, I want to give you some information about some stocks. He said, I serve on the board of a company in California called Liquid Metal. And liquid metal is a wonderful little product. They can make metal products with such thin layers. And it's very durable and very hard. And he said, Ken, Apple is about to buy into this company. Because the hope is that someday they can make this iPhone out of liquid metal instead of glass. Wouldn't that make sense? Are you listening? Wouldn't that make sense? So when I drop it, it doesn't break so easily. And he said, now, I want to encourage you to buy some stock. He said, I have 2 million shares of stock that I was given as a board member. He makes his living consulting all over the world. But he said, I have 2 million shares. And he said, you cannot buy our stock before Apple makes this announcement because if you do, it's insider trading, and I'm going to get in big trouble, and you're going to get in big trouble. 
I'll call you when, it's, when it comes, when the announcement comes. So I'm waiting for the call, the day it's supposed to call. Come. He's given me the knowledge. He's given me the facts. But he's given it to me with such excitement and such energy because it's going to change his life. And he wants to share it with me. And so I'm there, and I buy 33,000 shares of liquid metal for $15,000. The very next day, my stock is worth $77,000. My friend, who had 10, 2 million shares, sold all of his. He did really well. I kept thinking, you know what? I think this could go really big. I, I think instead of $77,000, I could have $770,000. And I could have maybe $2 million someday. Wouldn't that change my life? By the way, I still have my 33,000 shares. The last time I looked, I think they were worth $3,200. <laughs> so my 15,000 has grown from 15,000 to 3,200, okay? Uh, I still believe in liquid metal, but not much. <laughs> okay? <laughs> But my friend gave me a story. My, my friend had his story to continue. He based it on knowledge. Here's what li liquid metal is. Here's what it can do. Here, here's, here's all the, the range of things it can be used for in this life. And, and it was personal to him. He had two million shares. Now, if the story is going to continue... And there are no more eyewitnesses. How can the story continue except we tell what we know, but we add to what we know? You see, what we try to do is get everybody to believe like we believe. Isn't that interesting? I try to get everybody to see everything just like I see it because I can see it more clearly than most people. That's a joke, okay? Bert, he, he shut me down again. No, it, it. But when I talk about the story of Jesus, and I tell the story like they're going to tell it over and over again in the book of Acts, and I tell it with just not knowledge, but I'm able to tell it today with, this is how it's done for me. And better than that, people can see. You know why that lady asked me if I'd been to church? You know the only reason she asked me if I'd been to church? I had this ridiculous coat on, and it was hot. I mean, I dress pants on. She knew I'd been to church. She didn't know it the way I greeted her, though. She didn't see any other kind of light coming from me. But when they see us being a light to this world, and we're able to talk about the peace and the joy and the calmness with which we're able to live our lives in a messed up world like this, and we're able to talk about the reality of the story of Jesus. Maybe people will listen. I've been complaining now for weeks. I'll just call it complaining. The direction our country's headed. Now, I've been complaining that, that there are less people attending church today, today than, than ever before. Now, I've been complaining about the direction that morality is going in this country. Maybe the problem is me. And maybe the problem is me in that the story can't continue. The story can't continue unless we be the right kind of witness. And it won't work just facts and figures alone. That'll convince no one of anything. It works when they see light coming forth from us and a smile coming forth from us, and not play some game that looks rigid, that looks stuffy, but we real, in a real sense, look to our Lord and look to our God and realize that so much has changed because He entered our lives and changed us. And not only that, I'm going to tell you something. He is coming back. He's going to come back in those clouds. 
And I want to be able to look at that with a smile and say, welcome, welcome. But I want other people to see that too and say, welcome. So, we're going to take the communion this morning. What I want you to do is just think about the story. The story. That's all this is. These emblems, it's all about the story. And Luke has just told us in, in just... How many minutes does it take to read 11 verses? Two minutes. For me, a little longer, but two minutes to tell the story. He died. He was raised. He ascended. He's coming back. He gave us a kingdom. Not like they were expecting, but he gave us a kingdom even better. Let's think about that as we take these emblems. The story continued in the in Galatians. Paul, uh, writing to the Galatians, here says, "Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins, to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom the glory forever and ever." Amen. The story continues today. He still saves us from the evil age. Let us pray. Dear God, we come before you this morning thanking you for this opportunity to come before you and thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross. Help us as we take this bread uh, emblem of his body to remember the sacrifice that you and he also made let's take it in a way that will be pleasing unto you in Jesus Christ's name Amen Dear God, we continue our prayer for this fruit of the vine that represents Jesus' blood that was shed on that cross. You shed that to take care of us, to cover our sins. We want to thank you for for doing that for us and help us to always remember that you are there for us. Even in, when we think evil is overtaking us, we can always come to you. Just Let us always remember that your blood covers a multitude of sins. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, I want to tell you how much we appreciate you being here this morning. Grateful for the visitors. I uh, know that it's, uh, again, Mother's Day. I hope each of you mothers is uh, blessed on this day, recognized this day, and hope you know how special you are and what a difference you made in your families and in our community and in our world. And I hope this morning that uh, you've been blessed by having this introductory lesson to this uh, book that I'm calling The Story Continues. And I hope that you understand what it means to let the story continue through our lives And that maybe this week, even this week, the story can continue through us to someone who does not know the story. So may you be blessed this week as we leave. We're going to sing a final song. We'll stand during that song. And we invite anyone who might have a need before this congregation to come. So let's, let's stand.
Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name. You're perfect in power, perfect in wisdom, perfect in holiness. We give you all praise. We thank you for blessing us beyond all imagination. We thank you above all for blessing us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'd help us to live today and every day from a heart of gratitude for your great love, and mercy, and grace in our lives. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.